everyone. Um, I want to begin by welcoming uh, all of the subcommittee members who are with us today, um, Task Force Chairs Representative Frank Cook and Deputy Attorney General Daryl Parsons, and also our guest speaker today, Chief Scott Thompson, and the members of the public who have joined us for this meeting. Let me begin by saying that we received very sad news um, that one of our subcommittee members, Umar Khalif Hassanel, passed away last week. Um, he was a veteran of the Vietnam War, a community leader, um, and he is survived by six children and 31 grandchildren, 22 great grandchildren. And so it is very sad to have learned of his passing. Um, he was a really powerful voice for the communities that he served throughout his life. I would also like to acknowledge um, the Milford police officer, Trooper First Class Webb, who was shot executing an arrest warrant on an attempted murder suspect in Rehoboth last Friday. Well, actually just outside of Rehoboth. And, and I know that all of us on this subcommittee and, and people throughout our state are thinking and praying for him uh, and his recovery and for his family. It was a very stark and important reminder of the dangers law enforcement officers face each day while doing their jobs. Let me uh, just make, I believe, some necessary procedural comments before we begin. As chair of the Use of Force Subcommittee of the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force, and in accordance with the passage of House Concurrent Resolution 85, adopting rules of procedure for conducting virtual meetings of the General Assembly and its legislative committees during an emergency, this public body is authorized to meet virtually. Please note there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneous to this meeting in accordance with HCR 85. We are utilizing Zoom webinar for this virtual meeting. All members of this subcommittee have the ability to communicate contemporaneously on this platform. Should any subcommittee member experience technical difficulties, please call 302. 519-4629. The public may listen and participate in this meeting by registering via the meeting link that is posted on the General Assembly's website. The public may also observe through a live stream available on YouTube. A link to the live stream can be located on the General Assembly's website. Public comment will take place at the close of this meeting. Public attendees in the Zoom webinar must utilize the raise hand function uh, to speak and shall be called on in the order in which hands are raised. Members of the public will be unmuted and there is two minutes to speak. Public comments can also be submitted in advance of and up to 24 hours after this meeting by emailing leotaskforce at delaware.gov. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that any votes that may be taken during this meeting shall be done by a roll call vote. Let's begin today's meeting by taking a roll call of attendees of, of the subcommittee members. Subcommittee members, um, please, ensure that your cameras remain on for the entirety of the meeting. When your name is called, please unmute your device and affirm your attendance. Once you've been recorded as present, please mute your device for the duration of the roll call. I'll note from the beginning that uh, Middletown Police Chief Rob Kraisela is unable to join us today. So let's start with our Vice Chair, Carl Bond. Here. Larry Johnson. Yes. 
Great. Thanks, Larry. Marianne Kimball. Sorry, I'm multitasking. <laughs> That's quite all right. Uh, Marianne Kimball Moore. Present. Thank you. AJ a. Roop, State Prosecutor. Present. James Turner. Present. Lieutenant Thomas Bracken. Here. Representative Sean Lynn. Here. Dubar McGriff. Present. Brendan O'Neill. Here. Will Resto. Here. Yesenia Tavares. Here. Delisi Washington. Here. James Wright. Present. Steve Villanueva. Present. Thank you. Uh, that is 15 attendees uh, from the subcommittee who are present. I'll just note that in order to adopt a proposal that will require a vote of eight, a minimum vote of eight. The first item on our agenda is the draft minutes that have been posted and distributed in advance of this meeting. I wanna thank the team at the house for preparing these minutes. If subcommittee members have no revisions or additions to these draft minutes, I will entertain a motion to approve them. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, the minutes are adopted as drafted. Thank you. The next item on the agenda um, is our guest speaker, Scott Thompson, Chief, Chief Thompson. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it seems like whenever uh, an important matter in policing uh, is, is in question or needs to be determined uh, over the years, the first person I call on is Chief Scott Thompson. We got to know each other through the Violence Reduction Network when Chief Thompson was Chief of the Camden Police Department in New Jersey. He is, uh, has become a dear friend of mine and uh, just a, a resource, a fount of knowledge over the years and wisdom. I've known him for a long time, um, both with his work in the Camden Police Department and the Police Executive Research Forum, which is a nationwide and outstanding think tank for policing in our country. Chief Thompson's work in Camden has been significant Camden is a city that has many similarities in size and demographics with our largest city, the city of Wilmington. Through Chief Thompson's leadership, he has successfully reduced violent crime significantly through the transformation of their law enforcement approach. There are so many topics upon which uh, Chief Thompson could speak, one of which is our shared love of the play Hamilton. So Chief, you are now in the room where it happens. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to hearing from you on de-escalation. Well, thank you, General. I'll try not to miss my shot. Um, <laughs> it's an honor. Uh, I've got many friends in Delaware, many friends in Delaware law enforcement. Uh, I, 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 uh, and General, you, you are a dear friend. So it's an honor for me to be able to um, participate today and, and share with you uh, the experiences that I've had in, in within hopefully within 15 minutes uh, to try to add some value to um, the, uh, the, the topic here. Um, so it, 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 indulge me for, for, for one minute to establish a, a backdrop because I think it's important from a context perspective to understand where we came from in, 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 uh, in Camden. Um, like the general said, Camden is a city of uh, not much unlike Wilmington. It's, uh, it's nine square miles. It's a, it's a population of 77,000. And cities of 50,000 or more 
It's the poorest in the country with a per capita income of less than $14,000 a year. It's 96% minority. Uh, it has the highest levels of extreme poverty in, in the state, highest levels of unemployment. It's this perfect storm of social inequities that often the symptom is crime. And when you understand Camden's history, you know that the downfall of the city started about five decades ago in the late 60s, early 70s, when there was a series of race riots that were predicated upon acts of police violence. Um, that caused industries to leave, businesses to leave, uh, the middle class fled. Uh, and then there was just a series of cascading events that just compounded the, the challenges in the city uh, in making, just, just making the infrastructure crumble. And, and again, a very extremely challenging environment. But all through this, the levels of mistrust from the police uh, or from the community to the police were extremely high. Um, <clears throat> You know, I came on the, the organization in the early 90s. Uh, the, the department that I came on to uh, had a mentality that there was very little that we could do to change the dynamic of the city, that, uh, you know, we would measure our, our progress by how quickly we responded to calls and whether we solved crime or not. But we didn't believe we could prevent crime. And we, and we believe that most of these issues were outside of our control. Um, and there was this, uh, this, this, there's just this mentality that did not serve itself well to build uh, trust uh, with its, its, its community. In 2013, we went on a different path and we needed to redefine our relationship with the community. And we put a hyper focus on community policing. However, uh, you know, community policing is, is, is an extremely important component. I'm a huge, proponent of it, <clears throat> restructured my organization so that officers could have more time to engage with citizens and the like. But in this process, we, we also knew that how we used force upon our citizenry was a fundamental human rights issue. And that when we, when we knew our history and where the, the levels of, of, of really extremely strong feelings, animus, hatred, dependent upon who you talk to, um, but uh, this was rooted, again, in how we used force. And uh, we knew we needed to get that right. Because you can have police officers all day long engaging in acts of goodwill and uh, you know, trying to build relationships and trust. And you know, the, the organization, unfortunately, we've seen this across the country, can very easily be defined by your worst officer and their worst moment. And that if we did not get how we used force right upon our citizenry, it, really nothing else there mattered. And at the time um, we were uh, in, in, in the police executive research forum, we were doing a lot of research on the re-engineering use of force. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, extremely brilliant police leaders who had forgotten more about being a police chief than I would ever know uh, about how we should re how we should consider uh, our approach to force and the like, um, and it was within this that we knew that we we had to take an approach where we would reprogram our organization, um, and the reprogram of this was not just to be a training exercise. We did not want this to just be, and it could not just be a check the box PowerPoint presentation. Everybody signs off that they received it, uh, and and then we move on. We wanted de-escalation to be part of our culture. And what is culture? Culture is a shared set of values and beliefs. Culture is just the way things are. And we all know organizations, uh, and we've all been a part of organizations where there are elements of negative culture. And oftentimes to the people that are within it, they don't fully understand how negative it truly is unless they listen to somebody from, from outside or they, they actually venture outside and then look at it from, from a different perspective. But so this reprogramming was one that was rooted in the, in the definition of, uh, of, of avoiding in, insanity, right? What's the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Um, but 
so we know we, we needed to take a different approach to things. And we did not want our decision making on when we used force and how we used force to be solely dictated by the law. Because then it becomes, uh, you know, the, 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 the issue of just because you can use force doesn't mean that you should use force. And that if we can avoid using force, that it was ultimately would be better for everybody involved, not just the citizenry and the, the people, the public, but for the officers as well. And we had to get away from the traditional mentality in policing and for the law enforcement folks that are, that are on the call, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where the saying is, you know, make sure you go home at the end of your shift. And absolutely, you should make sure you go home at the end of your shift. But why not engage in behaviors that make sure that everybody goes home at the end of the shift? And that the sanctity of human life, everybody's life, is of value. And that we would um, codify policy, train our officers, and actuate them in a way that would make it safer for everybody. So when you look at traditional policing, the policing uh, of the academy that I went through, um, you know, what by and large is one, we know that the law is police officers don't, don't have to, um, um, Police officers don't ever have to, to, to back off. Police officers don't ever have to retreat. Uh, police officers uh, have no duty to, to, uh, to, um, to back off of a situation. Um, and that the, and what training has taught us over the years was that you know, command and control, you get on scenes and you, know, uh, you, you, you uh, uh, exhibit uh, authority quickly, you bring resolution to situations as, as fast as possible, you exert control, uh, and, and that uh, that leads to safer outcomes. Um, and there are some times that that's whole, that holds true. But what we have seen over time, uh, particularly with the delegation by government, by society, of the police being the uh, sole responders for issues of addiction, homelessness, and mental illness, is that sometimes in these situations, relying upon traditional tactics can actually make the situation worse. It can escalate the, 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 um, the, uh, the environment or the, the intersection, the interaction between the, the individual, the police officers trying to, to, to establish control of the situation individuals of. Uh, and uh, um, and What's key in that, and this is part of the de-escalation training that, that we ended up adopting in, into our organization, was that uh, we needed to be able to train officers uh, so that they could recognize these elements, that they could, when, you know, when, when they're seeing the physical manifestations of indicators that there may be somebody that's either under the influence, in mental distress, uh, and the like that uh, it better informed how they could approach the situation. And understanding that really the art of de-escalation is about slowing things down and providing more options for the officers uh, is to not have them uh, position themselves in situations where the only option they have left is that of deadly force. And we've all seen those uh, really unsightly videos that have taken place over time where there are, are just really poor tactical decisions that are made, wherein at the moment in time when the officer used force, was that moment uh, justified? Was, was the situation in which they were confronted, uh, were they able to use force in a lawful manner system with the law? And the answer would be yes but we would find that it was one of these lawful but awful situations that um, just the public at large and even police would look at this and say, man, that officer could have handled that better. That officer should not have rushed into that situation. That officer should not uh, have done some of these things and that this, the jeopardy that was created 
was more so from the officer's actions than from the individual. And then the officer had limited their options by their poor use of tactics, by their poor lack of recognition of what the situation is, where now the only thing that they had left was the pulling of the trigger. And if we as law enforcement leaders could invest in our folks in a meaningful way, we just don't write policy, we just don't give them a PowerPoint presentation. And we understand that when police officers are in these life and death situations, when they need to, to, to make a split second decision, what we know from the science of it is that the adrenaline is pumping, cortisol levels are high. Uh, you know, it, it, it's one in which the fine motor skills in one's cognitive process shut down and gross motor skills take over. And gross motor skills are fight or flight. And, the, and what, what, what can be depended upon in those situations is that which they've been trained to do, not which they've read about, but things that they have actually physically engaged in. And, uh, and through repetition, it is these types of, 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 it's this type of training that can enforce the type of behaviors you want when the situation is live. That's the same reason why in police academies across the country, there's so much time spent on the range of, of, of handling the weapon, fixing jams and the like. And it's so that in the, when, when that moment hits and the, and the malfunction occurs, that it's not something they need to think about, it's just something that they engage in. So um, we knew that in, in implementing our de-escalation, uh, the expectation that we had with the policy that we had established through our uh, 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 codification within the organization was one that we needed to make sure that the officers were, were, were properly prepared. And we invested very heavily in that. We did reality-based training um, in where we would introduce uh, artificial stress, which is really what basic training in either in the military or uh, uh, power military uh, of police academies uh, attempts to do, is so that you make mistakes in that environment, but you become conditioned to having to operate in, in high, highly, you know, high stakes situations in, in, in which, you know, your blood pressure's up and all those other physical things that I talked about before. And so that by, by doing this reality-based training, what we focused on was, was enabling officers to have the physical ability to reposition. Um, you know, one thing I learned very early on is that, you know, uh, no cop ever wants to retreat, right? So we took the word retreat out of, out of our, our curriculum and we call it tactically repositioning and nobody wants to retreat, but everybody will tactically reposition. Um, so, you know, but we were not training them to do that. We weren't training officers on how to reholster their weapons, how to, you know, after they had their gun out and they realized that they don't need the gun, can they reholster and move? And what we found is through this entire process, and even with when we did ICAT and re-engineering use of force with, uh, with the Police Executive Research Forum, was that this type of training was uh, very commonplace. And it was a skill set that, that, that is possessed by the most tactically trained police officers in our country. Uh, we had with, um, uh, from, from in, in Perf, we brought in the NYPD ESU unit. Uh, that's a full-time SWAT team from high steel rescue to uh, high risk uh, warrants to hostage rescue, the snipers, the whole nine yards. Um, we brought in Houston. We brought in the, 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 some of the best tactical minds in policing. And really what we learned was that that which we're talking about doing is not something new. Anything that I just talked about is not something new, but it was training that was reserved for an elite unit. It was, they were tools that were reserved for an elite unit. And we were not putting the officers who were on scene within seconds of the incident. And then when it's rapidly unfolding, we were not giving them this training. We were not giving them the tools. Uh, and, you know, the reality of it is, is that it's not safer for the officer and that so by physically putting them through the training and showing them that they can reholster, they can utilize cover, they can create distance. You know, we were eliminating 
one of the deadly sins of policing, which is tombstone courage. And that it's okay to do these things. Don't be, we can't all walk around in the situation, in, in, in confronting situations where, and uh, you would hear this in locker rooms and in, in roll call rooms is you should have shot him. I would have shot him. And, you know, this pressure of, you know, uh, just because the, the, the ability to utilize deadly force was there, I should have used it. And, and again, just because you can do something doesn't mean you, sh you, 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 you should do something. <clears throat> um, so we, uh, in wrapping up the, the, the training and the like, we, we invested very heavily into the officers. Um, we then put systems of accountability in place. Um, and, and what I, what I knew, and I, and I, I utilize this approach in anything uh, really with, with, with regards to training the organization. At first, it starts with policy. Policy codifies the behavior and, and, and crystallizes what the expectation is. Training uh, shows the officer and helps the officer to be able to perform uh, the, the actions that the, the organization, its leader has, has put forth through policy. Um, and then there's systems of accountability, which how are we ensuring that which we have written down, that which we've established, that which we have trained to, how are we ensuring that is what people are doing? So the systems of accountability. And then the fourth and probably one of the most important components of it was, is, are the, the reward system. When we get the type of behaviors we want, are we positively rewarding it? And when you think about policing and, and probably one of our shortfalls over time was that in our award ceremonies, um, the people that get the heroism awards and, and the like, and, and rightfully so, are, are, are the ones that actually engage in armed confrontations in which they discharge their weapons. And that officers who didn't discharge their weapons, but could have discharged their weapons and safely and successfully resolved the situation would never receive that same medal as the officer that did fire their, their weapon. And that there is a skill set to that that it should be recognized when officers uh, do the extraordinary and don't have to, to, to leverage deadly force, particularly when they could have, because they used the, 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 the training and, 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 and the expectations that we have, uh, we have put forward for them. Um, so it was through this type of repetition, part of our policy as well as every, every time an officer uses force in Camden, it is reviewed by two uh, supervisors before the end of the shift. Before anybody goes home, two supervisors need to review the body-worn camera footage to ensure the first line supervisor and then the commander uh, to ensure that that which was done was consistent with what was written in the report. That which was done was consistent with our policy uh, and, and our training. Um, and then after that, there are two or more levels of review back within the organization in which uh, one, our training officers will, uh, will review it and then our internal affairs will review it as well. And I, I think that this is an extremely important component that, um, that, we, that, that, that we got tremendous value out of. And that was before we did this, force was either good or bad. And bad being it was a violation of the law. And good meaning it wasn't a violation of the law. And if we would, if we were going to try to exist in an environment where things were, 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 were completely binary, and if it's not bad, then by default, it's good, we were never going to get better on anything. So by putting um, this hyper focus on how we used force with all these layers of review, we take a lot of corrective action, but we take action starting with coaching, starting with counseling, starting with re, you know, remedial training. Before we even start to look at, at, at negative discipline or prosecution, of course, so long as it's not an egregious criminal act that was, that was performed, but that we could not just say, well, the, 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 the complainant didn't file a complaint uh, so we'll, we will just pretend that this didn't occur. That did nobody any service. It certainly didn't help the officer. So, uh, you know, the things that get measured are the things that get performed. 
And as a leader, you can expect what you inspect. So by putting these multiple layers of review on, officers know that their behavior is going to be evaluated. They, their behavior is constantly being evaluated. They're constantly a part of this feedback loop of, hey, we watched the video, um, you know, we're setting aside time here. We're going to, to discuss this. Um, here are other options. Let's hear what, what were you thinking? What were you seeing? Uh, and we're learning as much about how we can get better in the evolution of this process from our officers as we are from, from, from anything else. Um, and so uh, I'll wrap up with this. We've been doing this over the last um, seven years. And uh, no, actually it's, it's, about, it's, it's about almost six years, five and a half years. It was, it was right around uh, the end of 20, 2014, 2015 um, that, uh, that we really went full bore with this. Um, since then, uh, not only have we been able to have much better community policing, which has led to much greater crime reduction, we've reduced murders in the city by more than 75%. Um, we, have, we have crime at a 51 year low now in the city. Every year since we've started this process, uh, we have seen a reduction. For the first time in five decades, we, we finally have a downward trajectory in, uh, in violent crime and overall crime. Our excessive force complaints dropped 97%. When we started this process, we had 95 excessive force complaints that year. And I think that was in 20, 2014. Um, last year, we had three. Now, our excessive, excessive force in New Jersey is not a self-kept statistic. It's a statistic that's kept by the prosecutor and by the attorney general. Um, so uh, this isn't uh, us grading our own homework on this. Uh, but we've reduced um, excessive force by 97%. Uh, and right before I left, uh, I, I, I would every, every other week, I would get this statistic uh, pushed to me. Uh, and to give you context of the environment in which we operate uh, with this de-escalation. Um, and I'll read you the numbers. So, uh, so I left in September of 2019. And we were at about five years in that process. And over that course of time, Camden police officers had been notified by the public on 13,376 calls that there was a, a person unlawfully possessing a firearm. So 13,000 times police officers went to a call of a, of a person illegally possessing a firearm over this time. On those 13,000 calls for service, there were 1,000 581 times that somebody had a gun and we arrested them. And we ended up seizing um, more than 1,600 guns in that process because obviously, you know, sometimes there's, there's, there's uh, more guns on scene. So over 13,000 calls for service, over 1,600 incidences wherein the person was actually armed and we seized more than, than uh, 1,600 guns. <clears throat> Can the police officers discharge their weapons five times? Three of those occasions, they were engaged by gunfire uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the assailant when they pulled up on scene. The other two were, um, ended up being suicide by, by cop situations wherein they were uh, ambushed by a person that either had an inoperable firearm or a fake firearm. But it was literally one of those situations where it was a split second decision it was the person was right in front of the officer. The person jumped out on an officer, had a gun, and the officer uh, 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 fired. Um, so 13,000 times we responded to that. 1,600 times person had a gun, uh, and only five times we discharged a firearm. And um, in, in my in my 11 years as a police chief, they're one of the, the my, my, what I prayed every night before I went to bed many prayers I, I have, but one of them is that I would never have to hand a folded flag uh, to the child or the survivor of one of my officers. Um, and I consider myself extremely, extremely fortunate that, uh, that I never had to, to do that. Um, and that, uh, so I, 
I say that to say to you that I did not take that this endeavor of engaging in de-escalation uh, lightly. Um, I was a tactical force officer for many years. Most of, of what I just said to you was completely contrary to what was ingrained in me as a, as a police officer when I was coming up. Um, but when I saw the benefits, uh, not just from a, uh, from a community trust uh, uh, perspective, when I saw the benefits of the safety to, to the officer's well-being, uh, I was all in on it. Thank you, Chief. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, remarkable to me, and I think to all of us, the work that you've done. And um, one of the goals, I believe, of this subcommittee of um, the task force generally is to take the best practices that we see in this country um, that effectively reduces the necessity for the use of force um, and at the same time uh, keeps our crime rate you know, going down. And in Camden, you were able to do it all. Um, so, you know, I'm extremely grateful uh, for you being here today and, and, and talking in the terms that I think each one of us um, can and needs to hear uh, that, that the work we're doing is important and the work we're doing can make a difference. Um, so with that said, if you have a couple of minutes for questions from the subcommittee members, I will ask uh, those individuals who want to ask a question to unmute and ask our chief. This is um, Inspector Wright, Wilmington Police, Deputy Police Chief out of Wilmington. I'm retired. Um, Chief um, Scott Thompson, um, thank you for your briefing today. And, and I want to um, thank you for the success that you had in the city of Camden. Um, just listening to you on many of your successes was an eye opener to me. I knew that was a challenge, especially coming out of um, Camden. But uh, I, one of the things that hit me that I, that I wanted to know, you started um, the process back in 2013 and most of the implementation came in 2014, 2015. And, and it sounds like um, implementing policy and change within your department came from the top and pushed down to the bottom. And I wanted to know how much pushback did you get back from your senior staff and, and also um, um, the police officers in your police department during that change? Mm. Well, that, that is a great question. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, there were, there were high, it's natural to have high levels of skepticism, right? Mm. Um, I myself, when, I mean, I'm, I'm a very challenging individual. I, I just don't take things at face value. So I put things through my own personal ringer and process. Um, <clears throat> But there certainly was uh, concerns that people had that they articulated. One of the things that, that I did, um, and, and, I, and I, 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 wanna, I wanna be clear in that, I don't ever look at what we did in Camden as success, because I don't think we ever crossed the finish line. I don't think we ever will cross the finish line. I think it's progress, right? And even the department, we did a significant shift. Um, it still has human beings. And we, we still make mistakes, but the idea is to try to make fewer and fewer mistakes each and every time. When, when we started to roll this out, um, I, what I needed to do in this was, uh, I, I identified who were, Camden is a department of 400 officers. I identified the 10 most influential people in the organization. The 10 people who had the highest, were the most respected individuals. The people who, and, and, and Inspector, you know what I'm talking about with this, that when, when leadership pushes out a policy, these are the folks that the rest of the roll call will look to 
and this person is the drum major. They will, if they say, oh, this is a good idea, then everyone else seems to think it's a good idea. Or if they say, ah, this is, this is, this is all political BS, then, uh, then people just start to repeat that. <clears throat> so I identified the, the 10 most influential people in the organization, and I brought them in. And I went through in great detail much of what, 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 uh, <clears throat> what I just talked about here and now. And um, I essentially had them tailor and refine for the specificity for Camden. Um, because as you know, right, what works in Camden doesn't mean it's going to work in Trenton or Wilmington or what works in Wilmington doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in Camden, but there are fundamentals. There are fundamentals. There are foundational things that apply across the board and the good leaders will identify those fundamentals and then take it and tailor it and shape it to be the work best for them and what their challenges are. So that was what I did with my 10 most influential people. Um, and essentially uh, I allowed them to, uh, I, I showed them the location on the map and said, this is where we're going to be, but you know the best way to get there. Now, make no mistake about it. We're getting to this destination and either I'm gonna chart the path or you're gonna chart the path. And trust me when I tell you, you know this better than me, you're much more skilled at this. I suggest you chart the path. Uh, and they did. and they then became the implementers. They then became the, 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 the uh, you know, I don't even want to say cheerleaders because it was something that they wholeheartedly believed in. Um, and that overcame significant uh, uh, skepticism and what was originally poised as resistance. And truth be told, some of these 10 probably would have resisted it. Um, you know, when you're looking at doing a significant shift, uh, and, and I know this, this, this in, in some circles, this, uh, this can be kind of sensitive, but I couldn't go with the, my traditional trainers, right? Because when I first went to them with it, they viewed it in the wrong light. They viewed this different direction as an invalidation of themselves. They viewed it as though, you know, they took it personal. And that, you know, we've done it right. We're doing it right. We don't need to change. And then their reflexive pushback was, you're going to get cops killed. You're going to get cops hurt. And I said, no, that, that's, not, that's not the case. But look, if you can't help us get to this destination, then I can need, need to remove you from the equation. Um, and the fact of the matter is that it's safer for officers. Less officers are getting hurt. No officers have gotten killed by it. Um, and every officer, when they get through the program, all said the same exact thing, which is, why weren't we doing this sooner? So uh, I did do a, a shift from, I didn't go with my traditional trainers. I actually pulled them out of it and uh, went with skill sets and leaders within the organization to be the ones that would implement it um, and, uh, and, and really be the ones that would uh, uh, champion it. So that's how we did that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, any other questions of the chief? Lieutenant Bracken. Good morning, chief. Thank you for uh, giving us some of your time. Um, you and I have actually met back when the state police were getting ready to go in and assist the Wilmington police. We came in and sat in on one of your ComStat meetings that included the New Jersey State Police contingent. And uh, you were very impressive then, and you're very impressive again today. So thank you uh, for your leadership. Um, one of the questions that I have, you, you highlighted that you had uh, lowered your um, use of force complaints to three, which is phenomenal in, in any, in any you know, measure that you can look at. But I'm interested in that those were three substantiated cases of use of force, not necessarily the total number of use of force complaints that came in. No, they, they were the complaints. So it was every time that there, there is a use of force complaint, it gets pushed over to uh, our prosecutor and our prosecutor makes a determination of whether it's excessive or not. If it's, if it's a, a use of force that does not deem to be excessive, 
then they push it back to us. If it's, if it's something that it's deemed to be excessive, then they hold it for their investigation. Um, the three allegations we had, only one was substantiated um, as an excessive force. And that individual was actually criminally prosecuted um, for that. But yeah, so it was, we went from having 97 uh, uh, reports of excessive use of force down to three. And of the three, there was one that was, uh, that was substantiated. Thank you for that. And as, as a follow-up, but you, when you talk about using the informal leaders in your, in your uh, team approach to de-escalation and changing the culture, did you also um, bring into the room members of the collective bargaining group, I believe it's the FOP that represented Camden, to get, to get them to buy in as well? You know, uh, the, we did have input. Um, some of the members were actually board members uh, of the FOP. Um, you know, I had always maintained open lines of communication with, uh, with my, my union leadership. Um, in fact, uh, it, last year, right before, uh, right before I left, we revised our entire use of force policy in which we had the FOP at the table with the ACLU and the community. Um, and uh, it basically came to a consensus on, on that use of force policy. But when, when, if there was anything from a major policy perspective, I, don't, I, I wouldn't do anything to the exclusion of anyone. Uh, everyone has, has the ability to give input and voice. Uh, and look, I, I, what I value too, LT, and, and I, remember, I remember meeting you uh, uh, on, the, on that day, um, is that if everybody's thinking the same, then no one is thinking. Uh, so when a lot of the, the opposition that came uh, it wasn't necessarily rooted in malice. They were, these were some legitimate questions by people. And um, so it, there was value that we gleaned from that. Um, and it also helped us with our own internal messaging and delivering is that, uh, you know, if, if, if this is the perception, then we need to find a way to, to either better message this uh, or something of, of, of value or concern was presented and, uh, and we would alter our course. And, you know, I've done that from input from, from the union. I've done that from input from regular officers. I've changed policy based upon citizens. Um, I've changed policy based upon the ACLU. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, that's a great question. And I, and I think that in any process, uh, you should try to get as many uh, opinions and thoughts as possible, even if they're not in line with yours. Because uh, oftentimes it better informs for for a uh, for, for for a much greater outcome. Thank you, Chief. I I think we have time for another question. If there are other questions from subcommittee members, all right. I do. I do have a question. Okay, is that James? Yes, it is. <laughs> Hi, James. Hi, how are you, A.G. Jennings? Good. Uh, good morning, Chief Thompson. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us and congratulations on, on the great record of success in your department and in Camden. Um, I, pro my question- It's progress, Mr. Turner. Pro progress, not success. Understood, <laughs> understood. No taken. Uh, Chief Thompson, uh, my question is, that it sounds like de-escalation was a really important part of, of that progress in Camden. And I'm wondering in your opinion, why is de-escalation so important and so beneficial to everyone? Yeah, that's a great question, Mr. Turner. You know, uh, de-escalation is, you know, getting back to my original comments, right? It's how, how government uses force upon its citizenry, upon its people is a human rights issue. Um, and there will, be, there is nothing that is of, of uh, greater concern to particularly challenged communities, Ch communities that already have you know, significant issues and concerns. Uh, and look, oftentimes many of these communities 
have a, a have a, a very heavy reliance upon police and you're you're you are in part of a daily interaction with with people um and if if you're not using force in a way that's proportional in a way that's just not just lawful but in a way that's just then you're not going to have trust you're not going to have legitimacy you know Community policing, the progress we were able to make in community policing was buttressed by the fact that we altered the way that we used force. We altered the way that we leveraged arrest and sanctions. Um, you know, a, another, another lane in this story was we completely changed our, um, our, our tactics within communities of we, we, we stopped writing so many tickets. We, we tried to reserve arrest for only the people that really needed to be arrested. And we stopped just relying upon that to try to quickly fix situations. Because we, if you look at things from a hypocritic oath perspective, oftentimes that can do more harm. And we needed for us to change the dynamic of extremely challenged neighborhoods. It wasn't going to come from us militarizing it and polarizing it. That's never worked anywhere in the long run. Sure, you can flood a neighborhood with a bunch of cops with in, in, in helmets and shotguns, and that will bring shootings to a, a temporary slowdown while they are there. But that's not sustainable. And that's not the United States of America. That's not a democracy. At some point in time, we're gonna have to leave. So the idea was to, was to rebuild communities so that they can sustain their own public safety. And what was key in that was for, uh, is for people to, to feel free and safe enough to leave their own homes. So, you know, it was constant engagement. It was less making arrests, less writing tickets, more officers occupying uh, space as a guardian and not a warrior. And then people started to flood the streets. And that's how we were able to take a city that had 175 open air drug markets down to 25. Now there's, there's neighborhoods that don't even have cops on the corner anymore. And it's sustained as being safer because of an empowerment of the community. And when you look at that process and realize like, as like a Jenga tower, if there's one peg that can make that entire thing fall out, it's how police use force. And knowing that that is such a critical component upon which everything else is gonna be built I wasn't going to have it be a liability. I, I was, it, for me, it was going to be a major investment of which I was going to solidify and make it as strong as possible um, so that I could build things on top of that. Um, and again, the, 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 the real, uh, the real uh, uh, benefit of all this is that everybody wins. This isn't not just about reducing crime and making neighborhoods safer and building trust and community policing, but this is actually safer for the officers themselves. So it's a win, win, win. AP hey, Jennings, can I make another statement? Of course. Out of all the presentations that we've sat through uh, regarding uh, the use of force, I, I want at least um, for um, James Turner to know that I, I've identified de-escalation as the basis of the success and change to most of these organizations. And they were the basis of most of these presentations that, that we've sat through. I, I just wanted to point that out from my perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. and. Um, I am so very grateful to you, Scott. You, <laughs> whenever I've asked you um, for input, you've always been there. Your uh, input today, I think we can all agree, has just been incredibly valuable to the work we're doing here in Delaware. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, we can't all watch Hamilton right now <laughs> in a live theater, but uh, I, uh, I think that that you know our our mutually shared love of that play says a lot um, in terms of the kind of person you are. 
and you will always be in the room where it happens because mm -hmm. uh, your your successes, excuse me, your progress, progress. has been uh, amazing. And and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, General, thank you. Um, it was an honor to participate today. And I, I, I thank you for your leadership and the committee in putting the time in on this uh, critically important issue. Um, you know, law enforcement is at a watershed moment in our country. Uh, and it's the decisions that we make today of which are really going to establish, uh, you know, um, a lot of things for the direction. Um, and, and, I, and I'll leave with this. I, I looked at the, the shifting sands of, of, um, of my vocation, particularly after Ferguson, right? In that the, uh, in a, in a democracy, the police to be effective need the consent of the people, right? We, we don't govern them by martial law. We, 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 our role is one that relies upon people believing that we are legitimate. And when that starts to be questioned, uh, whether it's right or wrong, and for many of us that wear the badge, we feel vilified and we, we want to put up a, you know, our shield. And we, we don't think that it's, it's, it's fair what's being dead said to us. But the fact of the matter is, is the sands are shifting. The ground is moving. And there, when you are in environments that are evolving, if you don't adapt, you cease to exist. And that, you know, being willing and uh, um, committing yourself to learning as much as, as you can so that you can shift with the times, I, I think is critically important. And I think that ultimately at the end of the day, the efforts like the, 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 the committee is putting forth here um, will save people's lives and will save officers' lives. So it's my honor to uh, to, 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 to be with, spend time with you uh, all this afternoon and, and good luck with everything uh, that, that you were doing. And happy holidays, everybody, as well. Happy holidays to you, Chief. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and great information. Thank you for the work. Thank you, uh, Chief. That was amazing. Okay. Um, we're now going to turn to uh, submitted recommendations of the subcommittee. And I'd like to begin this portion of our meeting um, by thanking everyone who took the time and effort uh, to submit recommendations and you know, the work, and also to say this, the, as Chief Thompson just said, the work we are doing is not easy. Um, and we are not going to agree on each and everything. Um, but I believe that everyone on the subcommittee and members of the public um, all embrace the, the fact that Police officers have a tough job. They have a very dangerous job. And that at the same time, we have communities that have disengaged, um, that have said the trust is broken and we all need to figure out the best ways to come together. I have tremendous respect for the work that the police do. I've worked with the police for my entire career as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney. And I know firsthand how much good police officers care about the communities that they serve. I also am deeply connected to people in the communities we serve who believe that things have to change. Change is hard. One of my closest friends has a saying on his desk, hard things are hard to do. And that's the work of this subcommittee to come up with recommendations that, you know, we are going to have to try to reach consensus on. Some will be easier than others, but I wanna begin by thanking you 
for taking hours and hours and hours out of your very busy lives to figure out a way to make Delaware better and to bring us all together. So let me turn first to the first set of recommendations. Um, although the first set of recommendations um, indicate that they're from me, they are frankly a compilation of much of what we have been talking about over these many months and a compilation of um, recommendations made by our speakers and uh, by experts in policing. And so, uh, although I am submitting them, I am not <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination um, taking credit for them. So I can read these off. I think maybe what we should do with the different sets of recommendations is that, that I'll read them if we agree with the recommendations as a group, we can take a vote if there's discussion and significant disagreement on one or more recommendations, um, then we should separate them out, if that makes sense. Okay. So let's start with the, this set of recommendations, which is to amend Delaware's use of force statute to establish a reasonable objective standard require the use of body-worn camera devices for all law enforcement throughout the state to make it its usage mandatory and universal, which among other things would require that body-worn cameras be activated and audio functions activated on all devices uh, from the beginning to the end of an interaction with a suspect or witness. Establish a statewide program, invest and deploy the daily use of body cameras for all police officers throughout the state of Delaware. Third is to expand the Department of Justice Division of Civil Rights and Public Trust statutory authority to review police use of force cases in cases of serious physical injury in addition to what exists now, which is our role in deadly force cases. Four is to standardize use of force reporting by law enforcement agencies and establish standardized data to include race for reports on the use of force incidents. Five, establish a public database for substantiated use of force cases. Six, expand mental health supports for law enforcement officers by investing in the mental health and welfare of our officers. Seven, establish a statewide standard use of force policy that must include provisions specific to de-escalation, the duty to intervene and report any law enforcement violations. Eight, expand mental health crisis response in collaboration with law enforcement to better address emergency response to people in crisis. Nine, expand de-escalation training for all law enforcement officers in our state. So let's turn to uh, discussion on that first set of submissions. And then I will call for a roll call if appropriate, and we can move on to the next set. Hey, G. Jennings. Yes. On amending Delaware's use of force statute to establish a reasonable objective standard, we're talking about doing that across the board, correct? Not just for law enforcement. Lieutenant, I, the initial thought that the Department of Justice had is that the use of force um, should be objectively reasonable for everyone in the state, not um, specific to law enforcement. Having said that, I would just note a couple of things. One is we are an outlier in the country. Um, I believe there are only three other states that have a subjective use of force justification statute. Um, 
it would be the Department of Justice's view that it should change across the board. However, I have listened to um, comments from members of the public and I have heard comments as well and listened to uh, members of our subcommittee from the Office of Defense Services. And there have been suggestions or recommendations made by one or more subcommittee members that the objective reasonable standard should be specific to law enforcement use of force given their greater training and the fact that they are authorized by law um, to use deadly force if necessary. And so I left it rather broad because it was my feeling that the legislature's going to parse through this and make a determination. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question completely, but I left it broad for that reason. Thank you. The only second point of or question is um, on subsection A of your second proposal, which is um, recording devices from the beginning to end of an interaction with a suspect or witness. Um, I think if we were to etch that in stone, it could potentially lead to a lack, an even greater lack of cooperation of critical witnesses at certain crime scenes and to certain crimes when they make it very clear that they don't want to be video or audio recorded, but they may be, they may have uh, very important information uh, to a serious crime. That's a very good comment. I, I agree. I believe that the current statewide policy on body worn cameras takes that into account, which is if the witness is not willing to speak on camera um, and the witness says important information to convey that the camera can be turned off. So we can amend this to that extent, um, but I believe we're gonna have to have a really deep dive into a statewide policy for body worn cameras. Other members of our subcommittee have suggested that. I think it's an excellent suggestion and that's gonna involve public input uh, the input of our subcommittee members and um, importantly as well, the input of the police chief's council and members of the police department. And fi finally, um, so that we can skip over, I, I put a lot of verbiage in my recommendations, but much of them circle back to these bullet points that you have here. So I think um, we're all on the same page. And the one thing that I can tell you um, from the law enforcement perspective is that I think there's there's pretty sound agreement between um, the labor groups, um, the chiefs of police, and even most rank and file police officers, that one of the best things that we can do um, in trying to win back the trust of some members of the community is to get statewide policies, statewide training, and for a state this small, even though we have so many relatively so many police departments that, like you said, we got to do the hard work and the hard work is going to be to drag uh, some of these departments um, to the finish line and, um, and, and force them to participate and to be more progressive in their training and to uh, adopt statewide policies and then to be held accountable and how we how we find the way, just like the chief said, you know, there has to be measures of accountability uh, with some of our departments who may be resistant or may not um, necessarily uh, go all in and, and ascribe to this sort of thinking because uh, they become they may become very territorial as we've all seen over the years. But I think much of what we've discussed is already happening in some of our agencies to a very high degree and that it's out there for the other agencies. We just got to make them do it. Well said. Are Thank there- you, Jim. Jim Ray. Hi, Jim. I'm taking a look at um, two alpha on there and 
I'm very supportive in and 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 the fact that it, it should be mandatory to activate the video and audio functions from start to finish. And and as as a person that was an undercover officer and everything, I think that those reluctant people at the scene who don't want to speak to officers, they all engage at a at a later time. And and normally it's not at the scene, if you know what I mean. It's it's you know, you're gonna find a lot of times that a lot of a lot of the witnesses and suspects they're not they may not say a lot of stuff at the scene, but at a later time when they're being interviewed by detectives or whatever, that's when we get that information that we need. I just wanted to point that out. Would it be better because I think the discussions that we're having right now are about when the camera should be turned on and off. Um, and that's going to have to be developed in a statewide policy. Would it be better for that recommendation to read that um, there shall be a statewide policy on um, the usage of body worn cameras and make that a recommendation for legislation. As, as the New Jersey Attorney General said, not legislating the actual policy the way it reads, but legislating a requirement that there be a statewide policy and that that policy receive input from the public as, as well as police departments and um, the FOP, the DSTA as well. So that we're getting a very broad input from the community, but the legislature isn't saying exactly what the policy should be. And, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that because like you said, uh, Jim, there's there's exceptions, right? I mean, people may not say something right at the scene. They're in front of other people while they're being recorded, whether they're being recorded or not, and then come forward later in a quieter setting. So, you know, we that's my preference, at least not to get in the weeds too much of what the policy should be, but to mandate that it be a policy arrived at after a full review by members of the public, by members of the subcommittee and, and by police. I agree. Does anyone disagree with that? Okay. Then. Um, Kathy? Yes. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, I had the raised hand function uh, but this is Sean Lynn. Hi, Sean. Just really briefly. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, and, and first off, thank you for, for everything that you've done so far on this subcommittee. I've really enjoyed um, listening to all the different various perspectives and really kind of enjoyed learning from um, all of these awesome speakers that we've, we've had the opportunity to, to hear. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on um, the standard um, that we've we've been talking about and, and that's present here um, in the presentation this morning. Um, and, and just brief say that um, you know the reasonable objective standard in my mind ought to be the very bare minimum. Um, and that when we have this opportunity to kind of really evaluate, the reasonable objective standard, um, I think that we should set the bar higher than that um, and really kind of strive uh, to do more and not just focus on the reasonableness of an officer's belief, but also their actions. Um, and I, along with that, I'd like to, to have some consideration for juries to consider you know, other factors, uh, whether the officer used de-escalation techniques if they did anything to increase the likelihood of a fatal encounter. Um, and then overall kind of the totality of the circumstances that surround an incident. Um, so while for our purposes this morning, yes, I agree that it ought to be a reasonable objective standard. 
but I think that for our purposes, we should, we should aim higher. That should be the very lowest bar, um, you know, for my, for I intend to advocate for when this comes before the general assembly is, you know, setting the bar as high as possible, uh, not just the reasonableness of the officer's beliefs, uh, but also their actual actions. And, you know, when we take a vote on this this morning, I, I want to just ensure that, you know, when I vote yes for this, that it's with the understanding that, you know, the reasonable objective standard is the lowest, um, you know, the lowest bar that I think we ought to be setting. Um, and, and again, thank you for your time this morning and, and allowing me to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Lynn. And, and it is left sort of broad, uh, as I discussed with Lieutenant Bracken. Um, I did it on purpose because we are going to see robust debate in the General Assembly about the specifics of what that use of force law um, should look like, including the Office of Defense Services proposal and Lieutenant Bracken's um, recommendation that it be for all citizens, not um, specific to police officers. And those those issues and many, many more that you've, you've raised here, Representative Lynn, are all going to be debated. Um, so I left it broad on purpose. And, and I realized that when we get to the Office of Defense Services proposal, it includes the reasonableness of an action as well as the reasonable belief of an officer that use of force was necessary. Um, but for purposes of our subcommittee, I wanted to make sure we at least had some common ground as a starting point. Okay, any other comments on this first set of recommendations? Hearing none, um, with the amendment that we have discussed to 2A, that instead of it saying it would be mandatory to activate video and audio functions on all body camera devices or other recording devices from the beginning to end of an interaction with a suspect or witness, uh, that that be stricken and substitute A be added that the state shall develop a body-worn camera policy that must be applied to all police departments after receiving public input and input from police agencies. I may have that wording a little bit wrong, but I think what instead A should be is that a statewide policy shall be developed that is mandatory for all police agencies. With that change, um, is there a motion to approve this set of recommendations? James Wright. So James Wright is the motion, is there a second? Second. Brendan O'Neill, I believe, was a second? Yes. Thank you. And uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? It is carried with a 15 vote of aye unanimously. Thank you. The next set of. Hey, hey Kathy, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to give an opportunity for not voting because I. I I can't I can't say yay on all on all nine as they're as they're currently written, but I mean I will agree to work work in the future to get it to something we could we would be willing to work with. So okay, I apologize, Lieutenant. Then that is uh Lieutenant Bracken not voting. Anyone else not voting? All right. Lieutenant, then it's it's one not voting, 14 um ayes and no nays. 
Moving on to the next set of recommendations. If we could have those up on the screen, please. And Delisi, would you like to go over the recommendations that you have taken a great deal of time, I know, to put together and submit for discussion? Sure, I guess I'll just go ahead and read through. Um, and so it's, it's my belief that the current use of force standard for Delaware is not adequate in holding officers accountable and that it's subjective. And so my recommendations are prioritizing making changes that get us to the highest standard possible. Um, and so I'll read through the list. Legislate new uh, statewide use of force standard, require online publication of complete use of force policies and procedures for all jurisdictions, ban chokehold airway restriction tactics, ban no knock warrants, raids, require de-escalation, warning before shooting, and use of force continuum, require duty to intervene, require initial and ongoing training on de-escalation and use of force, require comprehensive reporting whenever force is used or threatened, treat use of force reports as public records, include pre-arrest diversion programs, um, team with mental health crisis responders, um, or actually that was meant utilizing a team of mental health crisis responders versus solely depending on armed police officers for specific situations. Um, and then in terms of the statutes, um, considering objectively necessary based on the totality of cir circumstances, repealing officer's ability to use deadly force in certain situations. Um, and I provided some examples for that, adopting duty to identify and warn where feasible, requiring de-escalation and conflict avoidance, requiring ongoing training. Some of this is repeted, repetitive, but the ongoing training with de-escalation, conflict avoidance and crisis management, especially taking into account our population um, and people who are incidents with mental illness, cognitive de deficits, disabilities, or addictions. Require policies be put into law versus left to the discretion of internal policies. Um, I do support uh, the ODS drafts for new use of force bill. Um, and I also support Professor Lee's recommendations. Um, and some of those were using de-escalation measures, um, including attempts to calm the subject, taking cover, waiting for additional officers, requiring mental health assistance, um, any conduct by the officer that has increased the risk of confrontation or escalation, um, considering the time available for officers before having to make decisions to use deadly force, um, and whether the subject possessed or appeared to possess a deadly weapon um, and refused to surrender it. Now with body-worn cameras, I agree. I think we'll have more time to dive deeper, um, but some of the recommendations I was hoping we could consider were um, statewide policy in terms of its use, storage, and maintenance to improve compliance, eliminate human error and implicit bias. Um, community access to data and recordings, avoid disproportionate access, for example, for victims having to pay fees to access um, the footage, community involvement in decision making, including privacy protections, clearly defining camera policies um, and clearly articulating policies around evidence storage. Officers should advise citizens that they are being recorded and considering options for automatic activation of, of cameras so that police officers um, don't have to worry about when they, they are and aren't to the full extent. And so automated vehicle sensors or automatic um, uh, activation during foot pursuits, or if an officer is down or smart holster sensors with gunshot detection. I hope that was... Um, understandable to all. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Washington, and very much appreciated. You, you have spent a great deal of time on this. Do we have discussion um, from members of the subcommittee on these recommendations? Um, Madam Attorney General, this is this is Sean Lynn again. Um, just briefly, while that was a lot to digest, the the breadth and scope of all of those suggestions, I think, is the direction that we should be heading. And while all of them may not be within the purview of this committee, um, I think that those are the types of items that should be open for discussion. And um, would, would second uh, the motion that this be included in the proposals. And uh, AD Jennings. Yes, Dubar. Dubar. I can't find my read tan feature. I apologize. Yes, I second what um, Rep. Sean Lynn said, and um, Lucy spent a lot of time on this. I read through them. Um, we talked about these things on many occasions, and I totally agree that these need these, um, you know, with the community thinking of, you know, from a community um, perspective, these things have to be addressed and, um, you know, possibly made, in, uh, you know, it should be made into policy. Thank you, Dubar. Discussion? There, there has, uh, I'm probably outside Robert rules of order, so correct me if I am wrong. And I'm told from now on, I need to make sure I get a roll call vote uh, on anything that we recommend to the General Assembly. Uh, I, Having said that, I think um, that we are at the point where Sean, Representative Lynn has moved to have these recommendations considered by the General Assembly and that has been seconded. Um, we're, we're in discussion now prior to any vote. Hey, G. Jennings. Um, well, I, I certainly agree with some of the, some of the uh, topics and it's clear that Delisi put a lot of time and effort and is, <laughs> her proposals are very well written and, and I know um, you know, are worthy of uh, a lot more discussion than we have time to do here today. But I, I would just say that some of them are problematic from the perspective of law enforcement um, as it relates to potential officer safety concerns, et cetera. So if we're going to be voting on these as a um, take them all, then I would have to vote no. Um, because some of them do um, impact potentially officer safety. But I did want to make sure that when you hear a no vote, that I at least explain that there are some, some a lot of it has merit and, and is good. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Lieutenant. And, and I would know um, a great deal of work has gone into this um, and it's very comprehensive set of considerations so we look at number four under the first section, um, ban no-knock warrants and raids. I mean, I think as an example of, of where the Department of Justice, where as Attorney General I am on that, is that that needs to be studied. You know, there's a set of laws that govern no-knock warrants and raids. There, there is a set of constitutional law and case law that governs as well. And so it's an excellent area for topic for us to study as we go forward as a subcommittee. Um, and we're gonna talk for a few minutes at some point about where we go in the future. Um, my concern about that is that that requires a great deal of information and understanding um, of, of the law as well as the constitution, as well as the individual factual circumstances. Um, because no knock warrants can cover a broad array of situations. And, and it's definitely, as Lieutenant Bracken says, uh, I agree with him that, 
you know, these are these are considerations we ought to be having as a whole. And I think Representative Sean Lynn, if if I am incorrectly stating your motion, please um, please correct me as I know you would. But your motion is that we agree to consider the recommendations by Ms. Washington going forward and ask the General Assembly for their own consideration as well. Is that correct or am I wrong in that? No, you're exactly correct. The way I understood it was, um, although I agree that some of these topics are really kind of outside of the purview of this subcommittee, that you know we're kind of focusing our direction and kind of taking within the ambit of, of you know what our recommendations are going to be to include some of Ms. Washington's recommendations. Um, so I see it more as kind of steering the ship towards that direction. But no, I, I, I agree with you, Kathy. That was my interpretation as well. Okay. Second, yeah. motion. Thank you. Pass it on for consideration. And that's James Wright. Jim Wright. Yes. So it is uh, Representative Lynn's motion. A second from Jim Wright. Uh, and now I am told I have to have a vote of each subcommittee member by roll call. So uh, I will ask our vice chair, Carl Bond, how do you vote on the motion? Yes. Larry Johnson, how do you vote on the motion? Yes. Marianne Kemble Moore. I'm going to have to abstain. Um, and I wanted to share earlier with regard to uh, the list um, of proposals, our coalition hasn't had a chance to review them. So I, I can't say that we support them all at this point. So uh, just will not vote at this time. And if I could just clarify, I think we're not voting to support each and every one of these proposals. We are. I was, that's, I'm confused. I was confused and I raised my hand in the chat, but I, I um, apologize. Didn't I'm sorry, I didn't say it. Didn't that's say okay. it, but Marianne, we're not voting to adopt all of these, uh, nor to recommending, to recommend that the General Assembly adopt. We are voting to have our subcommittee, the Law Enforcement Task Force and the General Assembly consider these factors as they go forward. Okay, then I would like to change my vote from abstaining to uh, yes. Okay. And uh, State Prosecutor A.J. Roop, what is your vote? Yes. Jim Turner? James Turner? Yeah. Uh, yes. Lieutenant Bracken? I'm going to go no, not voting again, please. Representative Lynn, you moved. Yes. Dubar McGriff. Yes. Brendan O'Neill. Yes. William Resto. Will? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yesenia Tavares. Yes. Ms. Washington, Ms. Delisi Washington. Yes, and I just want to add that my priority is everyone's safety. That is my highest priority. So as we move forward, I just want it on the record that I am taking into account um, our law enforcement police officers and our community, all of them together, um, and everyone's safety. Thank you. Thank you. James Wright. Yes. Steve Villanueva. Yes. And I also vote yes, that we should take these into consideration. So I believe what we have are uh, 14 votes yes, and Lieutenant Bracken not voting. That, rec that set of recommendations for consideration is passed. The next recommendation is from Dubar McGriff. Dubar, would you please um, describe your recommendation for us so that we can have discussion in the vote? Yes, um, my recommendations are, uh, came from um, 
you know, me thinking of, you know, the intent, just the intent, you know, all the intentions behind policy changes are great, especially when it comes to African American communities. As we know throughout history, you know, the intentions are always great to do well, but it always somehow disproportionately affects African Americans and communities of color. So my main thing with a bunch of these policies, especially with the body warrant policies, to add a racial impact statement to all policies surrounding racial body warrant cameras, you know, because I know that we're in a digital time and, you know, most things that we do, or that we are getting recogniz recognition for is, or recognized for, like the George Floyd thing has been caught on camera. So if we can have a racial impact statements to body warrant cameras, you know, that would make the, um, and make the data, um, public is pu public public and um, have it assessed by non-police agencies on an annual basis. This is an opportunity for the police departments to find any disparities in the policies or procedures of reform that was, you know, um, came out of this discussion that was made into law and the best ways to approach the reforms if they are disproportionately affecting communities. And I also um, think this would also create a level of transparency, you know, even though we're not in a transparency group um, for better relationships with law enforcement in the community, you know. So um, I kept it short and sweet, but I definitely think that we do need to have data on how anything we decide, especially the use of force or affecting certain communities. And I think it should be assessed on an annual basis by police agencies, but also with non-police agencies to um, really like, you know, see if we're moving in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. McGriff. Is there a discussion on um, Dubard McGriff's proposal? AG Jennings, probably in a surprise, I think there's a lot of, of good Good merit in what Dubard is is recommending here, provided that I'm sure your office would be concerned that footage of an ongoing criminal investigation where it may be needed for prosecution and or uh, you know certain certain things that that need to be you know remain for a period of time outside the public purview um, as as decided by your office um, that we we would have to have some some discretion there, but that at some point obviously I think it makes good sense. Um, that that these things get get looked at from that from that perspective, um, not just by the uh, the police agencies, but by you know a group that that can that the police agencies can do their review and provide it to that group, but that that group could do their own uh, review as well. Thank you. Any other discussion on this proposal? I move like we did with um, Delisi's to. Uh, advance it for consideration. There has been a motion by Marianne Kimball Moore that this proposal be advanced for consideration. Do we have a second? A second. All right, I'll do a roll call again. And um, Carl Bond, Vice Chair, how do you vote? Yes. yes. Larry Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Marianne Kemble Moore? Yes. State Prosecutor Roop? Yes. James Turner? Yes. Lieutenant Thomas Branken? Yes. Representative Sean Lynn? Yes. Mr. McGriff, this is your proposal. Yes. Brendan O'Neill? Yes. Will Resto? Yes. Yesenia Tavares? Yes. Delisi Washington? Yes. James Wright? Yes. Steve Villanueva? Yes. And I also vote yes. So that is, uh, <coughs> I think I completed the roll call. There are no nays. Um, this proposal is advanced unanimously. Thank you. Moving to the next recommendation. Marianne Kemble Moore, these are your proposals. Um, would you please take the time to describe those to us? Yes, thank you so much. 
Um, I actually believe that uh, what we tried to capture in these four uh, recommendations were covered um, in greater detail in your proposals, uh, Attorney General Jennings. And so uh, we had not been able to come to consensus on including a reasonable standard across the board um, as we really hadn't explored legislation or policies related to that, but we felt that certainly our state should move to including a reasonable police officer standard, which was established by the US Supreme Court. We also, like the Attorney General's recommendation and others, um, request that we continue the review to ensure that there is a uniform application of use of force policies across police departments and that information on those incidents be available um, and reported in a consistent way. We've previously discussed the need for a statewide um, policy and collection process for body-worn cameras. Um, and like Delisi wanting to, and DeBard wanting to make sure that that footage um, when needed for civil matters or, or uh, um, review matters that those, uh, the footage of police body worn camera be made available to public um, in a reasonable way. And that we continue to examine uh, the state's response to individuals with mental health crises. Um, not only uh, the police response, but also how we provide support for police officers in the very difficult job that they have. We continue to put them on the front line and they are uh, in, in need of our support as much as the community is with regard to mental health support. So we, uh, we thank you for the opportunity uh, for this, uh, for us to be able to provide these proposals um, and hope that the group will consider them. Thank you, thank you very much. Is there discussion on these proposals? And I would know, um, you know, several of the proposals that we've already voted on and will vote on have overlap, overlapping um, recommendations, which is a good thing. And so um, I don't think that would be a, a reason for us not to favor uh, a proposal, but it serves to reemphasize the importance of those recommendations. So thank you. Discussion? Is there a motion to adopt Marianne Kemble Moore's initial recommendations? I move to adopt the recommendations as proposed by Marianne. Thank you. Mr. Roop, do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Lieutenant Bracken. Um, and I will conduct roll call. Uh, Carl Bond, what is your vote? Yes. Larry Johnson. Yes. Marianne Kemble Moore. Yes. AJ Roop. Yes. James Turner. Yes. Lieutenant Bracken. Yes. Representative Lynn. Yes. Dubar McGriff. Yes. Brendan O'Neill. Yes. Will Resto. Yes. Yesenia Tavares. Yes. Delisi Washington. Yes. Jim Wright. Yes. Steve Villanueva. Yes. And I vote yes. Is anyone not voting or a no? I don't believe so. So um, these recommendations will be uh, part of our overall recommendations uh, to the General Assembly. And that's with unanimous vote 15 present. The next uh, set of recommendations is from the Office of Defense Services. Brendan O'Neill, would you um, please explain your recommendations to us so that we can vote? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Kathy. Um, my recommendation really is just a somewhat more specific than uh, the recommendation that the uh, that that Kathy Jennings made in her um, 
her recommendation, which was uh, voted on and passed. And it really is a, uh, uh, something that's really specific. Um, you know, I have a little bit of experience at uh, uh, Legislative Hall, not near as much as Representative Lynn or Representative Cook, but among the things that we learn there uh, is that if you keep things simple and you get everybody on board, you got a good chance of getting something done. And that's, what I'm, uh, uh, that's why I proposed what I have proposed. And uh, what I'm proposing is a change to the Delaware statute that uh, is the justification defense for a law enforcement officer who's been accused of excessive force in a criminal prosecution. This is a very limited factual situation. This, is, this happens very, very rarely in our state. And uh, what happens is the Department of Justice has made an investigation. There has been a good faith judgment that this officer has all gone way off the reservation and used too much force and is being prosecuted for a crime. And the, the, the standard that ought to be in place to enable an officer to defend against that charge should be an objective standard. That's what Professor Lee told us in her presentation. That's what the Attorney General from the state of New Jersey told us in his presentation. And today, Scott Thompson told us that their statewide uh, policy is what governs how they do it. So every expert that we've had on board here supports an objective standard. And all of them, based on Professor Lee and my specific questions to the Attorney General from New Jersey was, does your standard address both the officer's belief that it must be reasonable under a totality of the circumstances and the officer's actions under the totality of circumstances? I specifically asked the New Jersey Attorney General that question because um, I wanted to focus on a statute that had uh, a reasonableness component and a requirement that the uh, uh, officer have a reasonable belief and that he acted reasonably. If he was just reasonable in his belief and his actions or her uh, belief and her actions, then they get the benefit of the defense. This is nothing radical. And it applies in a very limited situation in which our Department of Justice has already made a good faith judgment that the cop has gone off the reservation and used excessive force and a grand jury has charged that cop with going off the reservation by using excessive force. So it's a very limited circumstance and it's a very uh, uh, appropriate standard. So that's, uh, um, that's what I'm asking and I'm asking for a very specific thing from this subcommittee and that is a recommendation to the task force that we, we uh, uh, promote and support this kind of legislation. I don't want to identify all the specifics in a statute, but under all the totality of the circumstances, would a reasonable police officer have believed that force was needed? And would a reasonable police officer use the amount of force that was used in this particular case? If the officer satisfies that, the officer has a complete defense to the charge. That's all this is. That's all this is. So it applies in very narrow circumstances and it's the standard that's used in 48 of our 50 states. So that's what I'm asking. So that's uh, my motion that this subcommittee recommend to the task force to support legislation of this kind in the General Assembly in the upcoming session. This is Sean Lynn, I second the motion. Is there discussion on this? So the, the point of discussion that I would, I would just bring up, um, and I, am deeply, I deeply appreciate the Office of Defense Services um, proposal and also appreciate the fact that they have kept it very simple um, and that this, this type of law has been passed in other states as Professor Lee has noted. Um, I am still a little bit unclear on what objectively reasonable in the act portion of your proposal means, because as best I can determine, it means that the act of the officer itself must be proportionate to what the officer believes is necessary. I think that's already captured in the objective reasonableness standard 
um, of the officer's belief. And so I have no objection to it being more specific in the law uh, to both cover actions and belief. But I guess I need Brendan to just hear from you a in a little bit more detail of what you think that additional objective reasonableness standard means when it comes to actions. Sure, in, in, a, in a, a legal analogy, it, it might be an al it's analogous to say an imperfect manslaughter claim where a person is confronted with, such, with a situation that would ordinarily a, a, a person might uh, have a reasonable belief that um, he would entertain the thought of uh, doing severe bodily harm or something that caused death to a person, but then goes way over the top and then uh, opens up with an automatic weapon and puts 14 bullets into the person who's now deceased. And, and the person claims uh, manslaughter or self-defense, but it's an imperfect claim it could, because the response was so over the top that the actions were not reasonable. Self or a better analogy is an imperfect self-defense claim. And that is, I believed I was going to be in, uh, uh, you know, threatened by somebody. Uh, he came in, uh, at me with his fists and he was punching me and I immediately turned and shot him. So I overreacted and used too much force. My actions were unreasonable. Similar in a police situation, you may have someone that needs a, uh, uh, needs to be controlled. And instead of using, uh, you know, uh, a taser or using mace or wrestling the person to the ground, a police officer under the same circumstances unreasonably takes a gun out and shoots them. So the officer's belief that force was needed may be reasonable, but then the amount of force that he used was over the top and unreasonable. Is so that, there, thank you for that. For the defense and the defense is justification. It's, you were justified in doing this. Well, you might've been justified in believing that force was needed, but you're not justified in pulling out your gun and shooting the person under these facts. And the test is a totality of the circumstances and what would a reasonable police officer have done? So the use of force statute already somewhat addresses that and specifically mentions and contemplates that the use of force that you use in response to someone whether it's a police officer or a civilian has to be proportionate or reasonable compared to what's initially used against you, right? So your example of somebody punches you and you turn around and shoot them would already be contemplated by the statute. And my concern is the more detail that we get it, get with the statute and get outside of the objective reasonableness language, the, the more difficult it's going to be to explain to a jury because Ultimately, what we're doing is we're explaining this to a group of lay people, not lawyers. And the more complicated and difficult the analysis gets, the more complicated and difficult it will be to explain and to craft jury instructions that will go around that. So at least from where I'm sitting, and I think Kathy agrees, when we have this objective reasonableness standard, that's going to, that's going to uh, contemplate every action by the police officer in that situation up to and including their actual response and the initial force that was used against them. Well, I understand we're changing the statute. One, we want to change the standard from subjective, which it is now. I think we all agree that that's got to go. And so, you know, I think this simplifies it more because we're like, all right, let's look at his belief and then let's look at his actions. And, and I'm not trying to specify any particular act as being acceptable or unacceptable. I'm not identifying particular fact patterns. This is really broad, but it says you got to look at both parts, the belief and the actions. That's all it's saying. I don't think it complicates it. I think it simplifies it. So I'm, you know, I'm really hesitant right now to support the recommendation insofar as it, it covers actions as well as state of mind. Um, because I think it's already covered as state prosecutor group said, but I don't well, want to foreclose that, that if we, if we take a deeper dive into this as, as legislation always gets a much deeper dive when we get in front of the general assembly and, and legislators have to make, you know, these, these decisions that we're going to have a robust discussion about this. And it could very well be that, that, you know, after full discussion 
about exactly what this is and do we really need it, um, that I will support it. But right now, because it is so different from what is in the law, I mean, the law, you know, the reasonableness of someone's actions as self-defense right now isn't in the law at all. It's all subjective, as we know. Well, well, AJ just said it was in the law. He said it's already accounted for. Now you're saying it's not in the law. Which no, I, that's not what I'm saying. That. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that reasonableness of an action, I believe, is already accounted for in the scope of what an objective, reasonable officer would do under all of the circumstances, which is how the jury instruction would read. So right now, um, I'm gonna go is not voting um, because I, I may very well support this, but I just have to have a, a much deeper understanding of why we need that second part of the law. Well, my Any other- I appreciate oh, your candor and, and I appreciate uh, um, you know, your position. Um, ultimately what we are judging is what the cop did. So to put a, 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 specific, a specificity to looking at his actions, I think is entirely appropriate. So, you know, I understand your difference and, uh, you know, I respect your position. I, and I also want to commend you for the whole um, set of recommendations you started out with. I thought they were, uh, they were excellent. And I'm just trying to put a sort of finer point on the first one that you made. No, and I appreciate that. And I may very well support it. It's, it's just at this point in time, I'm not there. Um, any other discussion of this particular recommendation? Yeah, I, I, think I, I understand what Mr. O'Neill is saying about the actions of the officer. And I think it's something that we probably really need to look at in more deeply. And, you know, I don't think this should be dropped. This is something that probably should be looked at a little bit more in depth than what we're discussing here right now, because I understand exactly what he's saying. Uh, you use excessive force, you go overboard for the amount of force that, that needed to be used. So I think that's something that we definitely need to look at more in depth. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes. Dubar? Yeah, um, I also agree with um, uh, Mr. O'Neill uh, too, because you know, we, you know, when I'm looking at the law and we looking at situations and uh, we hold the person accountable for their actions of what they did. And we hire law enforcement to protect and serve the public and they're sworn in to do so. You know, and I think they should be held at a higher standard so, you know, their actions should be in consideration and we should look at the actions that they did when, you know, they done something wrong, you know, in, in, in a perspective that something wrong was done. We have to look at the action, you know, in my perspective, I'm not an attorney or anything. I'm just looking from a regular community perspective. I appreciate that. I think we all do, Dubar. All right, Kathy. Hey, it's Sean Lynn again. Um, and just very briefly, um, I support uh, Brendan's uh, proposal. And just for point of clarification, the way I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the votes that we're taking this morning, it's not really fully endorsing each and every element of every proposal. I see it more as steering the committee towards the ultimate destination of where we want to go. And these are the proposals that kind of get us to the ultimate destination. Um, so for those purposes, you know, kind of steering the committee in, a, in one direction or another, I believe that Brendan's proposals should be included um, in the proposals that we ultimately make to the General Assembly for, for ultimate consideration. I believe them to be kind of ideolo ideologically aligned with that, with Ms. Washington kind of initially proposed and see the kind of similarity in both the the ideology there and, and really ultimately where this committee ought to be headed. Um, and it sounds like this is the direction that the majority of the subcommittee um, ultimately wants us to end up. And, and really is Brendan probably more eloquently stated the point that I made earlier, which is that the reasonable objective standard in and of itself should be the lowest bar. Um, and that ideally what we should be aiming for is, is the highest bar that we, we can put in place. So 
for all of these reasons, I would ask the subcommittee to also endorse Brendan's proposal um, and put it forward to the General Assembly as part of the collective package, subject to refinement by this subcommittee um, as these meetings progress. But it, it's certainly worthy of consideration um, and ought to be considered. Thank you. And so I take it the motion is is not an endorsement specifically of the wording of this proposal as much as it is an endorsement of putting it in the package for consideration because I will heartily endorse that. I think we should be considering this and, and I'm gonna to continue to do that. Um, am I incorrect in that motion? Because I believe Representative Lynn, you made it. And, and Kathy, that's the way I understood kind of all of the motions that we're, we're making today. So for example, kind of going backwards uh, with Ms. Washington's initial proposal while some of them were really, again, kind of outside the scope and breadth of what the subcommittee is, is tasked with, with kind of doing, I still think that captured within her proposal were many of the objectives um, that I think we, we should be examining and ultimately should be recommending to, to the General Assembly. So I've kind of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I've misunderstood, but as each and, and um, each subcommittee member has kind of put forward the direction within which we're going um, as possible ultimate recommendations to the General Assembly. That's really kind of what I thought um, we were voting on is kind of um, kind of narrowing the issues down subject to to later um, honing and 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 further narrowing. Uh, but as part of our, our initial kind of um, narrowing and, and kind of winning down of the of the proposals that we're ultimately going to make, I have to believe that Brendan's uh, should be included, um, and and frankly, you know, and it's probably no surprise is ultimately where I'll be going um, when it comes time to make the final recommendations to the General Assembly about what we ought to be doing in the final report from the subcommittee. Um, but I agree with you, Kathy, that I don't think that means you're 100% on board with it, and that's going to be what you recommend ultimately. But really, it's I view it as kind of narrowing the issues for later consideration. If I'm incorrect in that, I apologize. Right. With the understanding, Representative Lynn, that your motion is that this set of recommendations be considered by the General Assembly, I would tend to vote yes. I will vote yes on that. Uh, so if that is the motion, is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. okay. Um, so we have Representative Lynn moving that this set of proposals be considered by the General Assembly. We have a second, I believe, from Carl Bond. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, and I'll do a roll call. Uh, Carl Bond, you vote yes? Yes. Larry Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Marianne Kemble Moore. Yes. State Prosecutor Roop. Yes. James Turner. Yes. Lieutenant Thomas Bracken. For the same reasons, not voting. Representative Lynn. Yes. Dubar McGriff. Yes. Brendan O'Neill. Yes. <laughs> Will Resto. Yes. Yesenia Tavares. Yes. Delisi Washington. Yes. Jim Wright. Yes. Steve Villanueva. Yes. And I vote yes. And so uh, any, there are no nays. Lieutenant Bracken is no, not voting. So that is uh, this recommendation for consideration passes 14 to nothing. All right, now we turn to um, Lieutenant Bracken's proposal. Uh, Lieutenant, would you please um, speak to this proposal? Yeah, so I'm gonna make it very easy. I put a lot of, a lot of words and um, much of what's buried inside his, are, are some of the things that we've discussed throughout our committee meetings and a lot of what we've already voted on. But I think one of the things that we do need to make a recommendation to the committee as a whole 
is that wherever possible, um, we need to do a much better job of, of trying to find a way for there to be better outcomes in any potential use of force situation between a citizen of Delaware and a member of Delaware's law enforcement uh, community. Um, much of what we're talking about here is policy and legislation, which may or may not help. But where the rubber meets the road is where a police officer encounters an individual or, or a, out on the street in a, in a situation where um, force may or may not be needed. And quite honestly, um, I think if you, if you use some of what uh, Chief Thompson was talking about, he was much more articulate than I was in what I'm trying to accomplish. But what I'm trying to say is one of the problems we see here in Delaware is that some of our agencies um, train differently, have a lack of an ability to train, they're not progressive in their training. They don't uh, adopt model policies that are available to them. They like to, some of them want to stovepipe their own uh, police department and adopt their own policy and training manuals. And quite frankly, it's been something that Kathy, you and I have discussed on several use of force type situations where we've said, you know, it's kind of crazy that we can't, um, come to a better way of training, uh, standardize our training, and, in, and then, you know, enforce accountability upon these police agencies. Um, you know, de-escalation training, we've all heard it. We do it, you know, we do it now. Just like the chief said, initially a lot of people were resistant to it, but it's become part of, of our job now. And, and, and one thing I wanna make known to, the, to, to everyone on this committee, and I know Carl will support this, there's not a police officer in Delaware that wants to go out and be involved in a deadly force situation. And, and, and they don't look for it. They look for every way possible to avoid it. Um, I'm not saying there may not be a bad apple in the bunch. I'm not gonna discount that, but I'm telling you that the vast majority, their lives are completely and totally impacted just in any type of force situation, but particularly when they're forced to use um, deadly force. So what I wanted to do was tailor something that would provide a way for people to come out of these um, these situations with a more positive chance of a positive outcome. And the best way to do that is to put some teeth into some type of legislation that says all police and we're too small to have multiple policies as it relates to use of force, training and de-escalation, training in how to approach um, disturbed persons, persons under the inf potentially under the influence, uh, persons with disabilities. We're way too small to not take advantage of our smallness and everyone be mandated to have that type of identical training from, from, from not just in the, uh, in the academies, but throughout your career, you must continue to get that type of training. We did it with the alert training so that every Delaware law enforcement officer now has um, basically a, a playbook to operate regardless of what agency you come from. If you get to an active shooter, say in a school, we're all trained the same way on how to react to that, that incident. It's kind, of, it's kind of similar to that idea that we, we should have that type of training for use of deadly force, for use of force, for pursuit policies, for de-escalation, and we need to be we need to make sure that those agencies who for whatever reasons don't meet the bar they got to be held accountable and if that means you know I, I hate to say this but if that means we need to disband an agency or to put an agency on probation until they get up to speed then that's what should be done but but if every police officer in delaware was mandated and, and attended and and worked at those things that are needed to be worked on to avoid having to use deadly force until until it's completely unavoidable, but to also go in with a skill set and the tools to address issues with people of multiple different perspectives when, when we when we get there. So and, and including cultural bias training, all of those things are things that I think would provide a better outcome because at the end of the day, we can do any policy and any law we want there's still going to be a deadly force encounter at some point in time in Delaware. 
and everyone's still going to Monday morning quarterback it to death. And we can we can look at policy and we can look at statute. But the best the best way to know that uh, the best outcome hopefully would come out of that is is if we train better and we mandate standards for all police in Delaware. Lieutenant, I really appreciate what you just said, and I I believe there's a broad consensus here for exactly that. Um, I do take issue with some of what you wrote down, and I don't think we need to get into that. Um, you know, what what happened in McDowell or, you know, former Attorney General Matt Den's proposal that we do have an objective use of force statute in our state. Um, so, you know, if your, if your recommendation is that we have a statewide mandatory policies as they relate to use of force, you know, high-speed chases, use of force, um, de-escalation, and that those statewide policies be mandated, I, for one, support that fully. So I, I'd like to hear what your actual recommendation is that we can vote on. So yes, that, that's it. And also that the, the, the training be done and certified trainers do it. Not, you know, we, it's kind of silly that we have so many different academies here in Delaware because that opens up the, the Pandora's box of who's, how are they being trained? And so there should probably be a statewide training regimen that every academy has to ascribe to so that these, the, the particularly in these critical areas, certainly policing is different in different, different jurisdictions, but in these key areas, there's no doubt that every police officer in Delaware needs to be on the exact same page, have access to the exact same ongoing training and, and updated training. Thank you. And, and so you're, I think highlighted now, your primary recommendation to this subcommittee is to create legislation that mandates mandate statewide training and policy in use of force that incorporates oversight and accountability to ensure compliance. Does that accurately sum up your recommendation? Yes. Thank you. Is there a motion um, to adopt this recommendation? Motion to adopt. Carl Bond, motion to adopt. Is there a second? I second, Marianne. Marianne Kemble Moore, second. Um, I'll take roll call. Carl Bond, do you yes. vote yes or no? Yes. Yes. Larry Johnson? Yes, with reservations. Okay. I just need to understand that so that we can accurately I, record your vote. Uh, make it a yes. I just have some concerns about the density of, of some of this, and I'm trying to plow my way through it and it uh, it does color my viewpoint on this, but um, in the overall scheme of things, I want to go ahead and say yes. Okay, thank you, Marianne Kemble Moore. Yes. AJ Roop. Yes. James Turner. Uh, specifically uh, regarding the last paragraph in the proposal. Uh, regarding de-escalation and that that not be added and also the suggestion that the change in the law be consistent it seems like that it be consistent for both officers and for civilians uh, I'm a little concerned about that last paragraph I do agree that training is necessary I agree with uh, the lieutenant's recommendations regarding the training and the statewide policy but I'm a little bit concerned about those two issues and so I, I will uh, I will not vote on, on this and not take a vote on this one. So James, I think, and I, you know, this is my fault. I wasn't really clear. I don't think we're, we're voting to adopt everything that's in Lieutenant Bracken's three page um, submission. And so that three page submission is in part of what we send along to the General Assembly because that's not what, what we're voting is specifically that one sentence um, in the submission in which he uh, suggests or recommends statewide policies 
that are mandatory and statewide training that is mandatory on matters concerning use of force. Understood, I, I will vote yes on, on that. Okay, and sorry, I, I have the same confusion, but that's why I think we're narrowing it down to that specific, those two specific recommendations. So you vote yes on that. Yes. Thank you. Lieutenant Bracken. Yes. Representative Lynn. Yes. Dubar McGriff. Yeah, just to make clear, you know, I understood you. We're voting on, so my primary recommendations to the subcommittee is to create legislation that mandates statewide training and policy and use of force that incorporates oversight and accountability to ensure compliance. Am I correct? That's absolutely correct. Yes, I can vote yes on that. Okay. And Brendan O'Neill? Yes. Will Resto? Yes. Yesenia Tavares. Yes. Delisi Washington. Yes. Jim Wright. James Wright. I'm reading uh, what you highlighted and the only thing that I would want added um, next to use of force is de-escalation because if you fail to put that in there when it goes to the legislators, they just look at one part and don't realize that de-escalation is part of that. Okay, so you're voting yes and you would like to see de-escalation added in. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Steve Villanueva? Yes. Okay, with the notation for James Wright's vote, um, I also uh, support this recommendation, so I vote yes. And that means uh, there are no no, no votes and no non-voting votes. So it passes 15 to nothing. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, it passes 15 to nothing. Thank you, Lieutenant Bracken. So um, I think I've been told not to keep you one moment longer because we still haven't done public comment. Um, uh, but I'm being told that the original recommendations I propose do need a roll call vote. So if we could do that, um, very quickly, uh, I voted yes. Carl Bond? Yes. Larry Johnson? Yes. Marianne Kemble Moore? Yes. AJ Roop? Yes. James Turner? Yes. Lieutenant Bracken? Not voting. Representative Lynn? Yes. Dubar McGriff? Yes. Brendan O'Neill? Yes. Will Resto? Yes. Yesenia Tavares? Yes. Delisi Washington? Yes. James Wright? Yes. Steve Villanueva? Yes. And I voted yes, so um, that is 14 yes, one not voting, Lieutenant Bracken. Thank you. That completes our uh, recommendations and um, I would like the committee to think about the vision for this subcommittee for our work as we enter 2021 with the start of the legislative session. Meeting uh, will become logistically more challenging. I am proposing that we meet next in February and continue gathering every other month. Um, if you are all amenable to that, I'm not sure we need a vote, we, we can vote every month if anyone believes we should continue. I mean, we can meet every month if everyone believes we should continue to do that. Excuse, pardon the interruption, uh, Attorney General. I apologize, but I have a personal family member. We've had a, a family matter that I need to attend to um, regarding planning for my father-in-law's funeral. So I, oh. I can't stay on any longer. I didn't realize we would go 
as long as we have. And I apologize to the committee members and to the public for having to, to leave early. Um, I, uh, but I wanted to also make sure that there wasn't anything you needed me further in terms of votes before I leave. No, and Marianne, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Kathy. Thank, thank you for taking any time out for us and for all the time you've taken. Certainly, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here and thank you all uh, for such a, an extraordinary effort these last few months. I look forward to the work in 2021 and wish you all a very blessed and happy and safe holiday. Thank you, Marianne. Condolences you for your loss. Thank you so much. So um, anyway, the proposal is that we meet every other month. If people believe we should continue, if anyone believes we should continue to meet every month, we can do that as well um, because I just don't wanna take up too much more of your time today. Okay, hearing none, um, our next meeting would be in February there are uh, objectives that this committee has, um, and I think we're going to need to defer discussion about what we are going to be talking about specifically in the next six months. Um, specific bill proposals will be one of those, um, but I do wanna leave time for public comment. So I will turn this over. Um, for public comment. And I believe, Alexis, are you handling that today? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. If you'd like to make public comment, please utilize the raise hand function. When I call your name, you will have two minutes to speak. It seems that no one is raising their hand for public comment. So I'll just say it one more time. If you would like to make public comment, please utilize the raise hand function. Okay, well, if you'd like to submit written public comment, please email your remarks at leotaskforce at Delaware.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa, much appreciated. I, um, I believe that completes our agenda for today. This has been a long, but very productive meeting um, I'm so grateful for everyone working on this subcommittee. It's really important to the people of the state of Delaware for everyone we serve. Um, and with that said, I wish you all uh, a happy holiday and stay safe, stay healthy. Take care. Thank you.